Hello everyone, my name is Anand and welcome to our talk on a systematic methodology for characterizing scalability of DNN accelerators using ScaleSim. Before I start my talk, I would like to thank my collaborators and my advisors for their invaluable contributions to this project. We all know that DNNs are huge computation beasts and their appetite for compute is growing day by day because of two main factors. First is that DNNs are really, really popular. So the number of applications using DNNs is increasing day by day. Second is that the latest and greatest DNN models proposed are extremely large, like the Megatron learning model by NVIDIA or the GPT-2, which comprise of billions of parameters. These leads to the following difficulties. First is that because there are so many applications and the, each application uses large models, the tolerance or latency for a single inference is really, really small. This also leads to lower energy efficiency. And we all know that benefits from device scaling is going down day by day. This leads to a very clear writing on the wall that we need accelerators with higher performance and power efficiency. Building large accelerators might seem like a very trivial problem. Uh, the easy part is to just add more compute power and build larger systems. Uh, this could be done in two main ways. The first is to make a really big single chip, like the Cerebras wafer scale processor or the TPU version 1. This approach is called scale-out. On the contrary, we have scale-out, which is to make a big collection of chips, like the TPU version 3 or NVIDIA Simba. However, the, the problematic part is to figure out how to attain high utilization in these large compute systems, how to orchestrate data to get higher efficiency. In this paper, we try to solve this problem and try to identify which design choice is more beneficial. In this talk, I will discuss about our target systems, the analytical model and the simulation infrastructure we use for our analysis, and then talk about our results. So let's take a look at our target systems. We use a monolithic systolic array and a distributed collection of smaller systolic arrays to model a scaled up and a scaled out system. In the monolithic systolic array, we can vary the sizes of the SRAM buffers and can also vary the rows and columns of the array. In the distributed setting, we can vary the number of smaller systolic arrays and within each of these array, we can vary the array dimensions and the sizes of the SRAM buffers. To keep the comparisons fair, we keep the number of MAC units and the total SRAM buffers allocated in each of these systems to be the same. The metrics we are interested in are runtime, the utilization of the compute, and the external bandwidth requirements. For our analysis, we developed an analytical model to get the first order insights on runtime and utilization, and we also wrote a cycle accurate simulator called ScaleSim, which is used to model systolic array-based DNN accelerator systems. Next, I would like to discuss the analytical model. However, before diving into the details of the modeling, I would like to introduce some of our assumptions and terminologies which we will use throughout our discussion. Our first assumption is that the computer is toll-free. This is quite reasonable because systolic arrays are simple structures with very deterministic behavior. Also, for the distributed case, we assume that the interconnect is toll-free, and this could be realized by having a non-blocking topology with sufficient bandwidth. We also assume that the on-chip memory system is toll-free, and this is realizable by having a double-buffered phase prefetch mechanism and having enough number of banks such that the number of bank conflicts could be eliminated. We also assume that the off-chip memory system is toll-free and it has enough bandwidth for the target DNN. We also want to describe some of the terms we use that are very specific to the convolution networks. A convolution window is the set of input pixels that are required to generate one output pixel. The output feature map is a three-dimensional matrix of pixels generated by convolving all the filters with the input. It can be thought of to be comprised of 2D matrices called channels each of which is generated by a specific filter. With the assumptions and terminology in place, now we can describe the details of the model. In this slide, we see the three possible mappings of convolution operation as a gem on a systolic array. A systolic array has two spatial dimensions. 
one along the row and other along the column, which we denote by SR and SC. The third dimension is time denoted by T. In this table, we show the allocation of various parameters along these spatial temporal dimensions for the three mapping strategies. We will refer to this table in the subsequent slides. Here, we describe the modeling for output stationary mapping. In this case, each MAC unit is responsible for generating one output pixel by computing and reducing the required partial sums. The parameters mapped along the spatial and temporal dimensions of the array are shown in the table below. Here, we are considering the ideal case where the entire computation fits into the array. The operand matrices are fed from the top and the left edges and are skewed to account for the timing in a store and forward setting. Please note that the bottom right map will finish the computation last and therefore is in the critical path. To calculate the compute time, we need to take into account four steps. First, the time for the first data to arrive at the edge of the bottom row, which takes SR minus one cycles. Next, the time required for this data to move to the bottom right map, taking SC minus one cycles. Then T cycles are spent in generating and reducing the partial sums. And finally, the last element needs extra SR cycles to eject from the array, thus leading to the expression here. Next, we show an alternative mapping strategy called weight stationary. In this case as well, we are assuming that the entire computation fits into the array. In this mapping, however, the elements of the filter are pre-filled into the array from the top edge and are stored for computations. The corresponding input elements are then streamed from the left edge and the partial sums are generated each cycle. The partial sums are then reduced across the rows to each column generating one output pixel at the bottom edge. Naturally, in this case, the rightmost row is in the critical path. Again, we need to consider for four steps in order to calculate the runtime. First, the array is prefilled from the top, which takes SR minus one cycles. Next, SC minus one cycles are needed for the first element of the input to reach the last row. The inputs are then streamed for T more cycles. Once all the inputs are streamed, it takes SR more cycles for the reduction and ejection of the final output pixel. This results in the expressions shown in the slide. For another mapping like input stationary, the same steps are followed leading to the same expression for runtime. The only difference being that the positions of the input operand matrix and the filter matrix are interchanged. Till now, we have talked about the ideal case where the computation completely fits into the array. In a realistic case, however, there will be mapping mismatches and we will observe some serialization. We call each such serial step a fold. The total number of fold is the product of serial mapping along the rows and along the columns. It can be calculated by the expression shown on the slide. The total runtime, therefore, is the runtime of each such fold multiplied by the number of folds. The runtime of each fold is simple to calculate as we have discussed in the previous slides, which leads to the expression shown here. Extending our model to distributed setting is also straightforward. In this setting, all the arrays work in parallel with the portion of the work allocated to each subarray. The final runtime, therefore, is the runtime of the slowest unit. This runtime can be calculated with either the same steps we used in the previous slides. The only adjustment needed to be made is to account for the reduced work denoted by SR prime and the SC prime terms shown in the bottom right. These sets of equations help us understand the behavior and efficiency of the mapping strategies on various workloads and array dimensions. To generate detailed performance estimate and accurate memory accesses, we wrote and used a simulator, which I will discuss next. We developed ScaleSim, which is a cycle accurate simulator for systolic array based DNN accelerators. ScaleSim takes in the accelerator architecture configuration, such as the array dimensions, the sizes of the SRAM buffers, and the mapping strategy as a config file. It also reads virtual parameters as a CSV file containing layer hyperparameters, such as dimensional matrices, the number of filters, etc., etc. It then generates a cycle accurate memory trace for on chip and off chip memory accesses. ScaleSim also reports the computation time, utilization, and the off chip bandwidth demand. 
The simulator is open source and available via ARMS GitHub mentioned in the link on the slide. We have been fortunate to be well received by the community with over 50 citations in about a couple of years time. In this slide, we show the console output generated by the simulator. The tool dumps a summary of inputs we provided and then displays the layer wise matrix. Here, the tool is reporting the cycles taken for computation of the example layer and the utilization obtained. Below, the tool also reports the off chip bandwidth demands for the three operand matrices. ScaleSim also provides detailed reports. The generated reports are mainly of two formats. The first is the cycle accurate DRAM and SRAM traces. SRAM traces show the memory access for both read and write at each cycle, while the DRAM traces depict the prefetch order, assuming that there are no SRAM misses. And then we have detailed metrics about runtime, utilization, bandwidth demands, and events reported in the summary files. Now, I would like to discuss the results. For our analysis, we ran simulations on a number of layers from the latest nets like GNMT, Transformer, DeepBench, and others, and recorded the performance and memory accesses for each run. This diagram depicts the design space of a scale system with varying MAC units. The y-axis shows various partition configurations, while the x-axis shows the different aspect ratios of a single array in each partition. Each of these red boxes show the configurations with equal number of MAC units. The bottom row here depicts the different configurations of monolithic arrays. The color scheme indicates the runtime of a configuration normalized to the highest runtime with the equivalent MAC units. The data shown here corresponds to the first layer of the transformer network run using an output stationary mapping. One immediate observation that we make is that the runtime decreases as we increase the number of partitions. More on the subsequent slides. In this slide, we dive deep into the performance for monolithic configurations. The figure in the left shows the variation of runtime and array utilization of 2 raised to power 14 max when the first layer of transformer network is run. The figure on the right captures the same information but for 2 raised to power 16 MAC units. We notice that the highest performance configuration is not the one with the best utilization. Also, this configuration varies with the number of MAC units for a given workload. This trend can be explained by counterbalancing of the two terms, runtime per fold, and the number of folds that we find in the analytical model we developed. In this case, the configuration with highest utilization is usually highly irregular, leading to a large runtime. On the other hand, configurations with low utilization increase the number of folds. Therefore, the sweet spot comes out to be an array configuration with conservative utilization leading to lower folds and per full runtime. Next, we compare the performance of monolithic and distributed configurations with equal number of MAC units. The chart on the left depicts the runtime of the most performance monolithic configuration normalized to the runtime of the most performant distributed configuration with the same number of MAC units. Each bar represents different MAC units and each point on the x-axis represents various layers in ResNet 50. The chart on the right depicts similar information but for a few layers of various language modeling networks. We notice that a distributed configuration is strictly more performant than its monolithic counterpart. This trend can also be explained by our analytical model. In a distributed setting, the array dimensions are always smaller than the monolithic configuration. Moreover, as work gets distributed, the number of serialization steps is also generally less, both contributing to a lower runtime. Does this mean that scale out is the clear choice? To answer this question, we examine the demand for off chip bandwidth. In the three charts, we show the cycles taken and the off chip bandwidth demand as a function of number of partitions for different MAC units. It is interesting to observe that the demand scale quickly with the partitions and surpasses the capacity of state of the art memory technologies like HBM, therefore, stifling the potential for further speed up. This observation is not surprising though. The increasing number of partitions we reduce the connections among the MAC units and also need to replicate data which lowers the effective SRAM capacity. This leads to dramatic drop in reuse and therefore efficiency. Possible mitigation can be found by improving reuse by using larger buffers. However, it is not only achieving the best performance that we care about. Energy efficiency is also an important design metric. 
We calculate the energy using the access counts and the cycles data from simulation and plot the energy for representative layers as we increase the partitions for various number of MAC units. We notice that unlike performance, there are definitive sweet spots. The, for fewer MAC units, we find monolithic configurations to be efficient, while partition configurations are favored as the compute capacity is increased. This brings us to the conclusion of the talk. To summarize, we show the search space for designing large DNN accelerators is non-intuitive even when using simple structures like systolic arrays. We describe an analytical model and a cycle accurate simulator scale sim which can systematically help determining the optimal configuration while scaling. Our analysis shows that we can find sweet spot for energy efficient configurations by employing the proposed method. Finally, I would like to encourage you to give scale sim a try. Any contribution to the tool are also highly appreciated. Plus, if you get a chance, please check out AstroSim Stop. It uses ScaleSim to model the compute code. Thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of the conference.